Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with John Pohl, the editor for Blitz, Bazoulay's The Color Purple. John, the film comes out December 25th, but you had the premiere and there have been a few early screenings. So what's it like to finally get some audience feedback and reaction? Um, it's really been moving to a lot of audience members. Yeah, it's 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 really kind of an amazing film. I mean, for me, the first few weeks into the movie, there were so many things that were moving me. I actually said to Blitz, I think that's the best film I've ever worked on. I can't believe we have like just a part of a movie and I'm uh, I'm moved in many ways. And uh, to be honest, still to this day, I watch the film and there are things that move me, different things that move me. And uh, it's really been amazing sharing it with uh, people who've never seen it before. Um, and you, you know what? Every screening is a little different. Some are more, more boisterous than others. Um, but everyone, uh, before leaving, somebody comes up or a bunch of people come up and go, wow, this was really something that affected me. And um, there's kind of nothing like that to work on a movie that, you know, personally, this changed me. Um, and I learned a lot. And seeing other people moved by it is kind of amazing. Um, makes it all very worthwhile. And Blitz had a new vision for this story. It was a reimagining through Seeley's imagination. So what were your initial discussions like with Blitz? And, you know, what was he like to work with as a director? Wow. Um, okay. So in the very beginning, I had, a, I had a, a Zoom meeting with Blitz. He was in Atlanta. I was working on a film in Los Angeles. And I thought it was going to be, you know, like a half hour, 45 minute get to know you kind of thing. And Blitz is playing me songs from the movie, early rough mixes of some of the songs that are in the movie right now. And um, he he pitched me his reason for making the movie, which was delving into the character of Seely and her imagination, which for those who uh, get to see the movie, you will see many different versions of Seely's fantasies. And many of them are, are musical numbers. And really what the movie, it gives, okay, the movie really gives Celie a voice and gives her other people in her life who help her and are looking out for her, her sisters. And you really see Celie change and grow. And as you're watching this movie, especially the beginning, you, you feel like, you're in trauma and then you're in recovery and then you're in more trauma and then you're in more recovery. And there are so many different kinds of feeling. And ultimately, I think at the end of the movie, um, hopefully if we've done our jobs right, you there's a, there's a sense of joy because this woman ha has, has found herself and you have to look at this movie and go, look at all the things that have happened to Celie. And if she can do this, and if she can come out of this, why can't I? Well, why shouldn't I? Almost everyone has felt like Celie at some point in their lives. Um, I think Oprah says, you know, everyone's an underdog. And who, who, who doesn't have this strong feeling? So it's pretty amazing. Blitz, uh, Blitz made a movie called Burial of Kojo a few years ago in his native Ghana for $40,000. Then he worked on Black is King with Beyonce. And now he's doing this film. And it's extraordinary working with someone who is such a consummate artist. I constantly forgot Blitz hasn't made 10 or 20 movies. He's His, his prep work on this film was astounding. Um, and then working with him was really interesting. You know, it, it's always a different relationship during production for an editor and a director and a new one, you're, you're, you know, you're looking to see how, how a director wants to work. Sometimes directors don't even really want to watch, um, watch cuts. They just feel like, okay, I'm making the movie. We'll do this later. Sometimes they want to watch cuts, but just to help them see what they're doing, but not necessarily to unwind and get into the minutia of editing. And um, Blitz just started coming into the cutting room. If he had a night shoot, he'd come in before the night shoot. If he wrapped early at sunset, he'd come in after that, or he'd come in on a weekend. 
And he said to me early on, you know, the way I want to work is I want to sit with you. I want us to watch what you've cut. And then I want us to talk about it and we'll make a plan. What's worth working on? What's not at this moment? And what was so valuable to me is I was able to, during the editor's cut, I was able to do a lot of his notes. And I was also able to experiment because he'd seen th things previous weeks. He was fine if I surprised him with something. And it was always interesting because, you know, if he liked it, great, we'd put it in the movie. If he said, no, I like it the way it was before. And it was always this learning process and, and sharing process that got us to the point where we were able to show the film to the producers, um, Oprah Winfrey, Steven Spielberg, and Scott Sanders. I think it was two or three weeks into the director's cut. We were nowhere near close enough at that moment to show an audience, but we felt like we had the movie in a shape to invite in these producers who Blitz had invited in at every moment. Um, and every step of the process, I don't think we ever got a note that we didn't try. And believe me, you get notes from lots of places. We would consider it, we would try it. Oftentimes people would say, suggest lifting a scene or lifting a musical number. And we wouldn't just lift it and look at it real quick. We would lift it and we would sit back and watch a half hour to an hour of the movie around it and see how it felt. So there was nothing that that got by us that we didn't try. And by the end of the film, we felt like we had the best version of the movie. Um, another thing that was amazing with Blitz is um, he, he asked me early on, he said, you know, I haven't been through this kind of process on a studio movie. What's the, what's the best thing we can do with this director's cut time? And I said, well, the sooner we can show it to an audience and start learning things that we'd rather learn before we show the studio, the better. And we were able to do that because, you know, we easily could have had a three hour movie to start with, but we knew we wanted a movie that was not rushed at all, but that wasn't crazy long. Uh, we, we were hoping not to have a three hour movie and we didn't pretty soon. And, um, you know, it's a, it's an unusual kind of film because it's about two hours and 10 minutes without the credits. And about half of that is dialogue scenes and half of that is musical numbers. And I think if the movie's working, it's, and hopefully it is, we're, 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 we're sort of making a shorthand with the audience. We fly through decades and we use um, timestamps to try and tell us where we are occasionally, but very occasionally. No, one's, no one really needs to keep track of it, but we're going through this 40, 45 year span and seeing these characters age and seeing their stories progress. And really we hoped that we could have a soft touch, not push the audience into feeling emotion, like not rushing score in and playing it too loud. It was always very subtle and intimate. And the movie does go back and forth between these huge scenes with a hundred dancers, or, you know, just when, when Suge Avery, Taraji P. Henson comes to the juke in her amazing red dress and sings, um, it's quite a big number with a lot of people and a lot of musicians. And then really the depth of the movie, the intimacy of the movie, the emotion of the movie comes through all the quiet moments and the moments between the characters. And we're finding ourselves going back and forth between different tones, back and forth between dialogue and music. And our biggest goal was to not have the feeling that you can sometimes in a musical that you're you're switching from one movie to another, that you're coming out of a dialogue scene, that's stopping, and now people are going to break out into song. And that does happen in the movie. The movie is a musical. There are 15 songs. But we worked very hard with score, with um, sound effects, with dialogue, with backgrounds even, to try and make those transitions as seamless as they could be. And I'll have to say many of those transitions were in Blitz's uh, original storyboard drawings for the movie. And of course you find ones that don't work quite like you thought they would, or you need to shorten something and you find a new way in the cutting room. But, um, you know, in short, working with Blitz uh, was an amazing collaboration because Blitz knew exactly what he wanted, but Blitz 
also knew that there were new things to try that he hadn't thought of. And he was always open. It doesn't mean he always liked them, but it meant he was always open. And that's an amazing thing. And I think uh, speaking for any editor, what could be better than to have someone who has a strong vision and is open to looking at new ways to do things. And uh, I think I think it helped us make a movie that feels a little different than most musicals um, and has a lot of intimacy and truth and personal moments. And really the, the cast is just amazing. And uh, there, there's not a, there's not, a character that's miscast in the entire movie and everyone does exactly what they're supposed to do and knows what they're doing. And there was just a feeling on the movie among the department heads, the crew, the cast, that we were all lucky to be part of something that we all hoped would reach other people and um, make people feel. Um, that's what this movie's about. You mentioned how it there's there's so many various transitions over time through in and out of a fantasy world. What are the biggest challenges in in bringing the viewer along without timestamps to know, OK, we've moved to a different time period. You know, what does that take as an editor to not lose the audience? And then we when we see Celie go into these fantasies, you have these moments of trauma that also you are, you're always bringing joy back in. I mean, the the audience never, it's not a, it, there's a lot going on, but it's never depressing. It's, 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 it's a joyful movie to experience. Yes, it is. It is ultimately a movie that, um, especially the beginning, the first half hour, uh, when we're with young Seeley, we are, you know, we're in a lot of trauma and there is recovery and joy, even in the midst of that, that always exists. But as the film goes on, there is more optimism and uh, there is more love in the movie and uh, more joy and more recovery as we go. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that's really interesting about the movie is sitting in an audience as it starts to unfold, because the first couple scenes are in real one that have these fantasies. And when they first come up, they're sort of surprising, you know. Young Seely is singing about She Be Mine, about the baby she had, and she's in the middle of a chain gang. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear by, by the time you get through the first few numbers that that was her imagination. And then she's with a bunch of washerwomen, and that's in her imagination. Um, and we go all the way to, there's a scene with a giant gramophone when- I uh, love that. It's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And those guys actually built a giant gramophone. The oh. day we got the dailies on that, uh, Joe Benford, our Atlanta assistant, just started screaming, guys, guys, come on, everybody come in here and look at this. Because we had seen a really rough, you know, kind of computer looking previous. We had no idea. They built a life-size turntable with a full life-size bathtub that Taraji P. Henson is in. And uh, Fantasia as Celie is singing a love song to her as she's in the bath. And um, when we come out of it, she slips and we're back in real life. I think at that moment, people understand we're, we're going to play this game a little differently. You're going to be surprised here. And um, there are many more fantasies in the movie. And then a lot of the other musical sequences really come about very naturally. They come about in the diegetic of the scene, as in uh, Taraji P. Henson as Suge coming in on the swamp in that red dress and going into that location really on a swamp and doing this incredible uh, blues rock number uh, called Push the Button. Um, also, the first musical number in the movie is uh, all the churchgoers going into the church and along that ride, we meet Celia and Nettie and uh, Alfonso, their father. So there's something about going into the musical sequences and having dialogue within some of them and meeting characters within them. And I think because most of the musical numbers are really driven by character, driven by story, 
and as always driven by emotion. Um, I, th I think hopefully people stay in the movie and don't feel like they're going back and forth from musical numbers to dramatic numbers. Cause look, there's 15 of them. There's a lot. I think that was possibly our biggest challenge. And um, we leaned on, you know, pre-lapping sound effects, syncopating music with sound effects happening in a scene. Um, and a really good example of that is the very first shot of the movie. It's quite a long shot. Starts overhead of Mr. We don't know who he is yet. You're just literally over his head under a tree. And even over the credits and the logos, we hear a syncopated clip, clop, clip, clop of the horse. And then the banjo comes in. And then the girls doing patty cake, you start to hear that before you see the girls in the tree and the camera veers up to the girls in the tree. So we're using sound effects, percussion from the horse, percussion from what the girls are doing, the music of the banjo, and it all sort of comes together. And you're not really sure what you're, you know you're meeting the girls, but you're not sure what else is going on. But I think on a, on a very human level, you know something's different about this movie. And uh, I think we, we get people's trust and uh, they seem to be coming along on the ride with us. And that's really a beautiful thing. There's nothing, nothing like sitting in an audience where they're feeling what you hope they're feeling and they're paying attention. And honestly, sometimes they're crying. It's very moving. And I'm almost out of time with you here, but I have to ask you about this because I've spoken with both Blitz and Fantasia um, about the musical number I'm here when mm -hmm. I spoke. Fantasia, she said he made her sing it about 86 times. <laughs> and um, I was like, how much did you torture her, Blitz? But, and he was saying, you know, if you have a singer like Fantasia, you don't dub her. I mean, so I'm curious what that was like for from your perspective as an editor. Is that something you get that many cuts of? Or what was it like for you piecing, piecing that sequence together to really, you know, bring the film home? You know, interestingly, Blitz had talked you know, we talked about every musical sequence and kind of how how they would be. And he said, look, this is this is Seeley's number. And Seeley actually hasn't sung a lot in the movie. And it, it also features the most live recording of any song in the movie and the most most that got into the movie. And there's a part of that scene where I think it's like 15, 20, 30 seconds where all the music goes away and it's just her. And it, she's singing about how she's beautiful and how she's here. And that's one of the most, uh, one of the most moving moments in the entire film. Um, I think, I don't know that there were 86 takes. <laughs> and I think we pretty quickly came up with uh, what, how we were going to play it. You know, the whole first chunk of it, which is quite long, I think it's two or three minutes long, is inside the store. And it comes off her memory of seeing the girls and goes right into the, the lyric about her sister. And you're sort of thrown back into the beginning of the movie and you follow Celia. It's this complicated shot Dan Lustin did, but there's not a cut. And then when she comes outside, we're still really letting her sing. There are not a lot of pyrotechnics of a camera here. It's a full shot of Sealy, and then there's a kind of a side angle close up, which we used sparingly. And we really let her let her do her thing in possibly the most presentational song in the movie. And it's just so powerful. And it is really a moment that you feel like this character has come full circle. Um, we were all worried about her in the first couple of reels, and there was a reason to worry all through the movie. And I think we're at a place at that moment where Fantasia is a full person. And some of that is owed to her friendship and love with Suge. And some of that is owed to her friendship and love with Sophia. So it's a really interesting triangle in that both of those women have their own B stories, but really they are there to lift up the character of Celia. Well, John, congratulations on the film and best of luck to you and the entire cast and crew of the Color Purple this award season. Thanks for chatting with Gold Derby today. 
Okay, thank you, Denton. Can I say one last little thing? Oh, go for it. Okay. Uh, I feel just incredibly lucky and in a lot of gratitude to have worked on a film like The Color Purple. And I just hope that this film reaches enough people who see it and are moved in the same way that many of us who worked on it are. Um, it's, it's a rarity in this world to embrace feeling and emotion in a movie uh, the way Blitz and uh, Alice Walker have taken us to this place. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Denton.